Good morning, everyone. My name is Maria Sarafoglu. I want to welcome you in our discussion at Delphi Economic Forum. The title is uh, From Reluctance to Boldness, a New Era for Germany. We're going to discuss about that, about the future of the most powerful European country with Mr. Markus Ferber, chairman of Hans Seidel Foundation, Mrs. Stormy Annika Mildner, executive director of Aspen Institute in Germany, and Mr. Christian Odenthal, European economics editor of The Economist. Thank you all. These are our speakers, and I'm going to start with our discussion. Within a few weeks, uh, Germany has reconsidered many things, its energy policy, its diplomatic stance towards Russia, and of course, its military role in the world. So, Olaf Scholz is talking about a historic turning point, a Zeitenwende. Mr. Ferber, are we dealing with a Zeitenwende, and to what extent? Yes, of course we are dealing with a Zeitenwende, with a change of uh, how things are seen. And honestly, I started my political career in the last Zeitenwende, which was 1989-1990, when, uh, of course, especially Germany was the winner of the fight of uh, the two systems. We had the reunification of our country, we have the breakdown of the Iron Wall, and of course we made new assessments economically, politically, for defense policies, and, and, and now this new Zeitenwende, this new change of time shows that all the estimations from the uh, 90s, that we will have long-standing peace in Europe, that we will have uh, no any more to defend our homeland, but we have to take more international responsibility, came not true. And I think that is really the Zeitenwende, if I may use this German word again, and I hope it will come to the English <laughs> language as well. Uh, and that means that Germany has to rethink its role. You said very clearly we are the most powerful economy in the European Union. We are number two in the NATO. So of course Germany has to deliver more than others. And uh, we are uh, a front state again. So not directly to the Ukraine, but uh, as we've been before 1990, front state uh, to the Warsaw Treaty organization that, of course, uh, needs new answers from Germany. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Milner? Yeah, I would also say that it is a Zeitenwende. Um, how bold we are going to be, though, I think this is uh, a question which isn't answered yet. Um, so for me, um, Zeitenwende has um, uh, five components. Uh, first of all, it was a shock to our system coming from the outside, which really shook the core of our belief system. Um, and um, secondly, I would say it really changed risk, risk perceptions um, in Germany, also in the population. Um, we felt pretty safe beforehand, um, being embedded in an international, liberal, multilateral system with conflicts being far away. Um, and that has totally changed. Um, the conflict, the war is very close to us, um, not just geographically, but also um, also in an economic sense, um, but just feeling very close. So I think this is a second component um, of what I would say is Zeitenwende. The third one I would say is that it is a, a real marking point um, in the security order in the European Union. There um, is a before and an after. Um, a before of semi-stability, and now we are in a period of, I would say, huge uncertainty and instability. And the last point, and this is also what you pointed at, um, I would say that it will mark, or at least I hope so, uh, um, a change in German foreign and security policy making with new aspects um, so and new pillars. It's no longer a policy of restraining Germany's foreign policy. Well, um, <laughs> this, is, this is exactly the question which is still open. Um, if you look at um, what was announced, I would say, and if that was all implemented as announced, then I would say it would be really bold with defense spending. Um, uh, the new security strategy, which has just been, um, the process to which has just been launched by Baerbock, um, if that all became true, then it would be a real Zeitenwende. But on the other hand side, I see some indicators, especially also with regard to defense spending, where maybe the 2% goal is not uh, uh, embedded in our um, budgets over the next years. And the 100 billion um, Sonderfonds special fund might be actually counted into the 2%. I mean, there's still lots of uncertainty around it, also with regard to 
weapon deliveries. What are we going to deliver to the Ukraine? Big, uh, big material or not? Strategic or not? Training people or not? I think this is actually an open question still. Mr. Odendal, are we dealing with an economic titan bent as well? I mean, is Germany willing to invest uh, to allow more debt funding um, in the future? So we, we, I think this, this, um, this issue of Zeitenwende in economic policy making has also um, been debated over the, over the last decade or so, you know, during the Euro crisis and, you know, other European countries were calling on Germany to do more. Um, and so our, our economic Zeitenwende came with a pandemic, really, because that was a point where Germany realized, okay, this is, this is the moment where we need to help to keep Europe together, united and economically strong. And Germany overstepped sort of very bright red lines during the pandemic, right? Common European debt, for example, right? Or um, explicit transfers from Germany and the Netherlands and the stronger countries towards South and East. Um, so we've had a little bit of Zeitenwende in economic policy making already because of the pandemic. Um, and I think one of, the, one of the motivating factors was that German policy making realized that with a changing geopolitical situation, um, Europe's economic strength and political unity is suddenly much more important. I mean, it was important before, but it became much more important through the, through the changing geopolitics of it. Uh, and so geopolitics, I think, has informed economic policy making already. But this Zeitenwende is not complete, right? We have now the question of, of an energy embargo, to what extent Germany is willing to take an economic hit for you know, a, a greater European security goal. Um, and Germany is very reluctant to do that, even though the economic hit, I mean, it depends on the estimates that you look at, anything between one and 6% of GDP, which is a huge economic hit, right? Don't get me wrong. Um, well, but Germany so is already accused by Brussels um, of acting on its own shake. Exactly. So now is the question to what, how, how far does our Zeitenwende go, right, about, over and above announcements, when it really starts hurting? Right? For example, when we have to pay the price for our completely failed energy and security policies over the last two decades, right? This is sort of the moment where the rest of Europe says, look, you know, this is your fault that you're that, ex that, that dependent on Russian energy, right? It's not that there weren't any warnings about doing that. Of, of all people by Donald Trump. Um, and, and he was laughed at at the time, right? Maybe because he was Donald Trump, but on substance, he was correct. Germany was making itself dependent on Russian energy. And now Europe is asking Germany to pay the price for it. Just as Germany, by the way, asked Italy and Spain and Greece during the Euro crisis to pay the price for their policy faults. Right? So Mrs. Milner, I'm coming back to you. Um, the German business model that uh, is depending so much on trade, do you think it is sustainable in the future? Mm. Um, well, first of all, I would say that um, trade and economic interdependence is something we shouldn't give up on. Um, it does create vulnerabilities, um, certainly, but it also is such an important pillar for prosperity, for jobs and growth, um, and not just in Germany, but worldwide. So I think we really need to be careful um, not to, how would you say, to throw out the baby with the bathwater, but keep on working um, on our international trading system and also on the WTO and make it fit again. At the same time, I have to say, and I always said so, is um, that Germany is really, if you look at trade to GDP figures, which is more than 80%, we are really dependent um, on trade. Um, and that does make us, us vulnerable. And we were accused of having, and, and it's true, very high um, trade surpluses vis-a-vis um, -vis many other EU members, but also around the world. And it would be in our interest to invest more at home um, and not just in uh, military spending terms, which needs to be done, but also infrastructure and also education. This is something which the US, um, not just Donald Trump, but his predecessor Obama already asked of us to do. Um, we were always pretty reluctant about it. But now it, it shows in, in the given situation that we really need to do something here. Um, I also wanted to say something um, on the energy dependence and what it would cost us. Um, and I also read the article by Krugman who said exactly the same thing, put it in perspective, um, what uh, the hit which Greece, for example, took by um, implementing the reforms was much larger than the hit which Germany would take by uh, implementing a, a gas embargo. But you also, I think, rightly point out that it would be a huge hit 
And what I am a little afraid of um, looking at those studies is that they might actually underestimate the hit because it doesn't, uh, many of them do not take into account the secondary effects, um, gas as an input, um, what is happening with other industries. Um, so it mostly, most of the studies look primarily at the energy side. And what I'm also afraid of that these studies underestimate how important Germany is for other European members and their economies. So our hit would be also felt really strongly by other European members. And just to illustrate that also with a number, 35% um, of our exports are inputs from other European members. So if we experience a, a recession um, and maybe a deep recession, that is going to be felt by all European, uh, other EU member states. So we need to be a little careful here what we talk about. It's not, a, not an individual German, uh, German issue, but it's, a, it's an EU issue which we need to look at as a whole. Interdependence. Absolutely. Mr. Ferber, um, can Germany cope with demands on the gas uh, thing if Russia freezes imports? Yeah, firstly, I want to say very clearly that we have a lot of member states in the European Union who hide themselves behind Germany. If I take only the Nord Stream 1 pipeline, which goes directly to Germany, more than 50% is for Central Eastern Europe. Czech Republic is fully dependent on Nord Stream 1, not we. So to be very clear, we have a lot of member states. Bulgaria, 100% dependent from Russian gas. Same for Romania, similar to Hungary. Similar to Poland, 80%. We are 55%. So number one, there are a lot of member states hiding behind Germany uh, because they know as long as Germany stands, uh, they will have the gas so supply. What happens now? Number one. Number two. Um, as was mentioned already, so in most member states, Russian gas is used for heating and cooling private households. In Germany, it is used for industry processes. And that will not hurt only Germany, that will hurt all Europe. Because if the front runner is not running anymore, the train is not moving, that means that a lot of other member states yeah, lose but the their front possibilities. Runners are changing their course yeah, but, now? But, but we have to be very clear what we are talking about, because uh, to have a suicide approach will not help anyone. And it is not true that if we stop today the gas delivery from Russia, tomorrow the war will stop. And, and that is the other issue we have to be very clear. Sorry that I'm so open-minded, because uh, that, that is uh, <clears throat> something we have to take into account. Honestly, I was a little bit surprised that our Minister for Economics and Energy mm -hmm. went, for example, to Dakar and... He was criticized for that. <laughs> ...and uh, asked, oh, please uh, uh, help us. Uh, it's not the stablest, most You're stable... You're opposed to securing alternative uh, yeah, energy sources. Yeah, of course, but uh, it's not a, a German issue, as I said. It's a European issue, and it makes yeah. no sense that we have a rolling door where all energy ministers of Europe went in, because what I hear from the world who is able to deliver, uh, they are very happy because every day another minister is coming, and that is, of course, increasing the prices. We should use our demand power as Europeans that we are not misused from those who are able to deliver. And that is why I accused the German minister as well, as he was one of these revolving door users, not asking for a European approach, because we have to fulfill the gas demand for all European countries, not only for Germany. And the other thing, to be very open-minded, and I stop being open-minded, for example, we have a wonderful gas pipeline from North Africa to Spain. But Central Europe has no access to it, because the Pyrenees are really a borderline, and France has no interest to build a pipeline from Spain to Central Europe. We have to overcome these things as well. We don't have access to renewables here from Greece, because we don't have uh, power lines uh, through Central Europe. And that are the questions we have to uh, solve by ourselves as well, that we really create a European network for energy supply uh, to overcome this dependency from Russia. Mm -hmm. So, Mr. Odenthal, you wanted to comment on something. So, um, <coughs> on, on these economic studies and what they're trying, they trying to look at, um, they explicitly try to look at these second round effects, not just the first hit to the industry, but also to what extent it hits other industries that are dependent on these supplies. Of course, it's difficult uh, to model all of that, right? There's no doubt about this, and there are uncertainties around these estimates. But that's why those who did these studies went with very conservative assumptions about uh, this interdependence. 
and, and came to a, to a hit of, of a maximum of 3% and others came to a hit of a maximum of 6%, which by, is a tremendous economic hit, right? But it's not a suicide, right? So this is sort of, in the terms of terminology, sort of as an economist, I have to insist that this is not, um, uh, that's, that, that, is, that is a severe recession is what we would call it, right? Um, on, on to what extent other European countries are hit by this? Of course, to the extent that there are no gas interconnections, that's an issue. But if we stopped um, energy imports from Russia, that would mean that all of Europe would pay a much, much, much higher price. It's not just Germany. So the oil price is a Europe-wide price, right? The gas price, to the extent that gas can be traded, and we are importing from LNG terminals from other countries, so we are connected to other countries, um, they would pay a very, very high price too. So I, I'm always wondering why is there such a singular focus on the economic hit that Germany would take, whereas sort of if the price rises for everyone, everybody in Europe is taking a hit. Um, I think it's correct that other countries are hiding uh, behind Germany because they know that Germany will, uh, will resist. Um, but it is not just the other European countries hiding behind Germany. It's Germany's genuine decision uh, not, not to go for an energy embargo. And as an economist, I sometimes Although wonder... Although German people are in favor. German people are in favor, though it, are it, it depends a little on how you ask in the question. Um, we will so discuss this issue it's, again. It's an issue whether it's cold because of Putin or you are unemployed because of Putin, and that will change people's minds. Sorry. So it depends a little on how you ask the question. Um, if you mm -hmm. ask for tougher sanctions on Russia, then people will agree. Also for the energy embargo. If you ask the question, to what extent do you support an energy embargo if it threatens the supply of energy to German households? Uh, then most the people are against different. it. Um, but from what we know from the te technical side, German households will not be affected. Right? They will be asked, of course, to, to, uh, um, to, to uh, use less. Uh, but it will be in these emergency plans. It's usually the industry that has got shut down first. But what about the European unity that you talked about before? Within Germany, um, selecting another way of securing its own shake first and then so we've dealing built, with... So we've built these energy markets as, um, as a competitive market, and that brought down prices, much to the dismay of Russia. Um, and from a structure of a competitive market where private suppliers secure their own supplies, towards a joint European approach to secure supplies is a, is a big step. And at this point, in, in this emergency, everybody's starting to try to, to, to secure supplies. I'm not sure whether this is the best approach, to be honest. But I, I appreciate that, that it's difficult to sort of change um, existing contracts and sort of existing ways to secure supplies. Yes, Ms. Um, I also wanted to come in on um, the public opinion. Um, and there was a poll before um, the war started last year on what is the biggest threat to households or what do you perceive as one of the biggest threats. And it was actually energy prices already before. Um, and um, what I. Uh, number one. And the second one is you also, if you look at the polling data, there are regional differences. So um, in, in general, there's about 55% of, of those polled, which would be in favor. And I agree that there are differences according to how the question is asked, but there are also regional differences. So in the uh, um, e eastern, you, uh, eastern German states, for example, the, the percentage of those who are in favor of a gas embargo is quite a bit lower um, than in the western, western states. And third, Thirdly, as um, we already see um, uh, quite a bit of inflation <laughs> also in Germany. What is it right now? 7%, 7 something? Um, and this, uh, this comes mainly um, from two factors, and that is energy and that is food. Um, and that is going to um, hit um, those who are already um, in the lower income segments most. Um, and we have seen an increasing income divide, um, not as bad as in other countries or by no means as bad as in the United States, but still we have seen that, that increasing gap. And um, this could widen um, and also um, having political implications um, also leading to more populism. We also have our share of populist parties, um, left and right, which are also regionally concentrated. Um, and that is something um, which needs to be dealt with. Um, I'm, this is not an argument against a gas embargo and not an argument against sanctions, but that is um, something politicians really need to take into account and do something about. Mm -hmm. And I also wanted to say 
Um, I, I was never a great fan on, of Nord Stream 2, for example, and, um, and I never understood why we were so... I mean, I'm true, a true believer of interdependence um, and trade and, and so on. Um, and, and I always counted myself as, as, as a liberal institutionalist thinking that oh, international in, interdependence integration would lead to peace and stability, and it did in the EU. But on the other hand, I never understood that we were so uh, laid back about all the dependencies we have um, on energy, but not just this, but also metals and minerals. And it's not just um, critical metals and minerals for, for the green transition or for mm -hmm. high-tech products. And it's not just our dependence on, on uh, Russia, it's also our dependence on China. Um, and of that course. is also something we really need to, to think about to address these vulnerabilities, I would and say. And I would like to ask Mr. Ferber about that. First of all, are German-Russian ties shattered after the Ukrainian war? I mean, will Germany continue to keep up space for Russia? And how that affects the relations with China, which is an important trading uh, partner for uh, Germany? Yeah. I think um, I, I read a nice uh, phrase uh, in February after the 24th. Uh, Germany has outsourced its security to the United States, its energy supply to Russia, and its wealth uh, to China. <laughs> and that is something we have to rethink. Honestly, on the security issue, I think NATO is the cornerstone, not only for Germany, but for Europe. No one else is able to protect us as the United States are together in the NATO, so I think that will continue. And uh, you saw uh, Germany is buying now planes in the United States. During the Trump area, it was no-go area. Now, uh, uh, era, it was no-go area. Now it works, uh, and there are good planes. By the way, I don't know why Europeans have not uh, developed these things. It's another story. On the energy supply, we really have to rethink, but uh, look to the political decisions. We said, oh, we don't want nuclear anymore. We said we don't want coal. Uh, because of CO2 emissions, and, uh, but we need gas as a bridge. And now if we created this dependency by ourselves and now we are hardly hurt, and, and that is something we have to overcome because we will not be able to replace it in short term by renewables or by other sources. We don't have a functioning LNG terminal, for example, no chance. We are dependent from other possibilities at the moment. We have to invest. It takes more than a few months. Uh, that's the second thing, and of course, on the wealth issue, and that was mentioned already, Germany was the pharmacy of the world in the early uh, 20th century. Now India is the pharmacy of the world, and we saw all the problems at the beginning of the COVID crisis, for example. So we have to bring more, not to Germany, but to Europe. A lot of things, what we call uh, to get more resilient, and I think that is very important. Uh, of course, the, the Wirtschaftswunder, to introduce another German word, which I think found its way to the English uh, in, 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 uh, after World War II, was driven by exports. And that became the economical model for Germany, that we are producing goods for the world market, high sophisticated. I'm a member of European Parliament as well. In my constituency, I have a lot of these mid-cap companies who are world market leaders in their special uh, area, and, and uh, that of course should continue, that's a good model, <laughs> but a lot of production had been outsourced. And uh, that is something where I think we have to bring back, uh, to be very clear, if you only mention one thing, IT technologies, we have the hardware from China, the software from the United States, and we have only the data protection. That is not delivering wealth, that is not delivering gross product, and therefore we have to rethink what we can do in Europe as well. So, Mr. Odenal, what do you think? And are relations with China affected by the war in Ukraine? So, uh, I think it's right that we have uh, created a lot of um, economic wealth through deeper integration and through outsourcing and through building up these supply chains. Uh, but what the pandemic has already shown is that um, if we are singularly dependent on one country or one region, doesn't matter whether which region that is, right? So if we are too dependent on ourselves and have a sort of Europe-wide lockdown, for example, then that doesn't really help. So it's really about uh, diversifying supply chains and making sure that, that there are uh, there, that there's a plan B, right? Mm -hmm. Lithuania, for example, just to come back to the to the gas issue, we haven't built LNG terminals simply because it's expensive and LNG wasn't really profitable as long as Russian gas came through pipelines. But having a plan B in place allows Lithuania, who was also dependent on Russian gas, 
uh, just to switch to its LNG terminals relatively quickly. It always had this as a plan B sitting around. Expensive, but still. And this is wh where we will need to invest more into to, be, to have more resilient supply chains, and they will be costly, right? So this is it's a loss. It's hard to find supplies right away. Exactly, LNG. so it, it's, it's not something that we can do exactly now, now, right away, but it's something we will need to build up over time. Mm -hmm. So Mrs. Milner now, um, are we going for a German Europe or a European Germany? Ooh, that is a very, very good question, which is also, um, also still, it's hard to really answer right now. Um, I hope that we are going for a Europe, Europe, <laughs> um, in which uh, Germany finds its uh, responsible space. Um, it is um, looking at, um, uh, again, military spending, for example. If the um, Sonderfonds came into place in the 2% spending um, annually, this would make us the biggest spender um, on, on defense within the, Europe, within the EU, I, um, uh, in, the, in, the U in Europe. I think, um, bigger, than, bigger than Great Britain, if I have the numbers right. Um, so that is something which um, would create a, a change um, in the European security architecture. And that is something where um, other um, EU members might be a little bit critical of um, because of our position in the past, if we don't manage that correctly. So um, I think our experience has shown um, the European Union for us, Germany, has always been pivotal for economic issues, for our wealth, for foreign security policy, and uh, we wouldn't be here where we are now without the European Union. So we need to, um, well, we need to put all our efforts into strengthening the European Union. And I would say that in the past um, 10 years, we were not always so good in this. Um, on one hand side, we were rhetorically always uh, a big supporter of the European Union, right? But when it then came down to certain policy areas um, and also um, dedicating or delegating more fiscal policy making to the European Union, we were one of the biggest opponents, if not the biggest opponent, if you discount uh, Great Britain. But um, we, um, we, in a sense, we prevented um, further integration in the EU and a further moderni modernization. I worked for the BDI, Federation of German Industries, um, over the past uh, seven, eight years, and I even saw it on our membership repeatedly. We were always a big supporter of the European Union, but when it then came to delegating power to the EU, we were <laughs> in, in many smaller areas, a lot of times reluctant, because we didn't trust the EU then to do the right thing, or the other EU member states. And um, I think this is a point of time now where Zeitenwende could also mean that Germany finds a new position within the European Union, overcoming, and I at least hope so, our reluctance and uh, become a bolder um, force for European integration. Mr. Ferber, a one short comment. Yeah, only a short comment. Uh, as we didn't join this famous club of the frugal force, to be honest, Germany was not on the break all the time on all these fiscal issues. There have been others, and uh, they named themselves the frugal force. Um, and they are still existing. Uh, maybe the Netherlands has a little bit changed because of the new government, but there are still three uh, in this frugal side, and uh, that was never Germany, and Germany delivered. The RRF, I think, is a good example that Germany was able to deliver. But I think it was never the German approach to make a German Europe, never, never ever. I have more concerns about a French Europe than a German Europe. And uh, uh, yeah, sorry, we don't know what's, what we don't going know to what's going to happen next Sunday when we have the first round of the presidential elections. But if I listen to the polls, which normally I don't do, but to see Macron and Le Pen are very close to each other, uh, that will change Europe more uh, than uh, what we are discussing till now. And, and therefore, I'm more concerned about these developments. And if you look on, on the eastern borderline, Hungary, where Mr. Orban was re-elected, I don't want to have a Hungarian Europe. So we really should concentrate of a Euro, on a European Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the best approach. Mr. Rodendal, very short comment. I agree. I mean, it's, you know, the, the shock of the pandemic, the changing geopolitics will make uh, Germany more open to deeper European integration. Um, and this crisis in Russia will also make Germany listen a bit more to Central and Eastern European concerns, I'm sure. Um, but 
you know, Germany has never had the idea of building a, a, a German Europe, right? It always wanted to be embedded in a European Europe. And uh, this crisis and the, and, and the pandemic and so forth will only reinforce that, I think. Well, thank you all for this conversation. Thank you all for watching. Thank you.